Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, Mika Altola, director of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome you all to our event on the Three Seas Initiative. It is an event that I have been personally looking forward uh, very much to. Uh, it is a topic that should be discussed more widely also in the Nordic uh, countries, among the uh, Nordic countries in the Nordic Baltic region. The initiative itself is a public-private effort to invest in digital and energy flows, as well as transport infrastructure in the key area of Europe, linking three maritime regions together. The crucial aspect of the initiative is the EU and US involvement in it. In the US, there is a bipartisan support behind the investments into the initiative. It is seen from the geoeconomic or could we say, say geo-infrastructural, geo-technological sense as posing a counterweight to China. At the same time, security sit uh, situation along the eastern flank countries has been experiencing challenges uh, lately. The key is for the region and its partners to think strategically also in terms of geoeconomy as well as infrastructure development. The Three Seas initiative is arguably one of the most strategic initiatives in the region, for it carries with it a vision to complete a forward-looking transformation of the Central and Eastern Europe. The key part of the equation is also internal development of the states in the region. Uh, it is vital to note that in the region there is quite a lot of economic growth. In relative terms, we are talking about high economic uh, growth countries. As we move forward, it is vital that this economic development is supported by large infrastructure development and by also strategic thinking concerning the diversification of supply chains. What is still ambiguous and lacking uh, from my perspective is the scope of the initiative, who belongs to it, who are the key owners of it, what are the ramifications for states that are not directly uh, taking part in it, how does it relate to wider strategic as well as geostrategic challenges. Uh, Three Cs initiative, uh, initiative is happening in the north-south corridor between Adriatic, Black Sea and Baltic Sea. However, it also adds to the infrastructure, infrastructure development in wider Euroasia and multiple different other initiatives that are flying about. So how does it link up with these other initiatives? Is it supplementary or complementary or is it both at the same time? So what is the strategic angle and sense in it? Um, to finish my opening remarks, I wish to thank the Embassy of Latvia in Austria, the Respublika Foundation in Warsaw, and the European Council on Foreign Relations Office in Sofia in making this event uh, possible in the first place. So thank you very much. Next, I will yield the floor to the chair of the event, who we uh, own the great gratitude of pulling this uh, event together, Dr. Rinna Kulla. Rinna Kulla is professor at the Tampere University, as well as a visiting professor at the University of Vienna. Her list of accomplishments and upwards mobilities uh, is very hard, difficult to keep track on, which is a descriptive of intellectual powerhouse uh, that she truly is. So, Rinna, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mika. Um, I'm Rina Kula. I'm a historian of Russian foreign relations, and my work has focused on the Balkans and the Mediterranean region in contemporary history. On top of that, I'm born in Finland and I grew up in Denmark. So it's very easy to understand why 
the Three Seas Initiative that engages the Black Sea, the Adriatic Sea and the Baltic Sea would be of particular interest to me. But here, um, I, together with UPI, thought that um, actually the initiative is also very much of interest um, to the Finnish public discussion. And since it hasn't been quite introduced to our public discussion, I would add a few um, points of interest or background information about the Three Cs initiative to our Finnish audience here as well. Um, I think it's important to note that the initiative that is geopolitical focuses in general on security in East and Central Europe. Um, it also strategically counters the security threats or influences of Russia and China by a multifaceted approach um, that doesn't only focus on military capabilities, but also today we will learn about a um, civil society aspect and an approach to security in the future that um, deals with connectivity of capital, digital connectivity, transport and human mobility. Um, for our Finnish audience, perhaps it's interesting to know that the initiative was initially sparked by thinking in Poland and Croatia and was brought together uh, from those initial ideas really by the United States, uh, now already under several administrations from the Obama administration through the Trump to current Biden administration. The member countries which we talk about, the 12 states uh, in geographic order, are Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Austria, Hungary, Slovenia, Croatia, Romania and Bulgaria. In addition to these 12 member states, the initiative also has partners, which are the United States, the European Commission and Germany. Um, and uh, we can see from this set of countries, I don't have a map, but you can in imagine it, uh, that the initiative is quite coherent, geographically connected countries. But if we think about what the set of countries, it's also very clear, at least to me, that this is an um, initiative focused on Russia and China and not, for example, focused on the France-Germany axis in the European Union. Under Angela Merkel, Germany, I have understood, was also interested in maybe joining the initiative. And there have been um, some talk about other members such as Ukraine, supported by Romania and other indications for new members. Yet at the present, the 12 members are quite a coherent and clearly understood group of member states. The initiative has a monetary fund towards which the United States has uh, pledged uh, significant funding, but also Poland, for example, it's my understanding, pledged 500 million euros and Romania was the second largest donor with 25 million euros. Um, I think that uh, on, in addition to monetary contributions and commitments, our Finland's Baltic neighbors, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania have been um, interested on a conceptual level on the initiative. And um, this interest and welcoming of the initiative has crossed political party lines. Um, if these are not enough reasons to be interested in the Three Seas initiative, I think it's good to note that our talk today is very timely, it's very contemporary. In the recent week, Secretary Blinken visited the OSCE meeting, which talked about European security in Sweden, also a Baltic country. Next year, Poland will become the chair country of the OSCE. And this week, the United States is also launching its first of its summits for democracy, where governments are brought together together with civil society to discuss um, strategies to build democratic resilience in the world. For all these reasons, I think that our uh, talk today could not be more timely. If we need one more reason to want to discuss the topic today, it's also the fact that next year, next spring, NATO led by the United States will write its strategic concept anew. The last time the strategic concept was drafted in 2010, it referred to Russia, for example, as a partner and made no mention of China. This year, the strategy, next year, the strategic concept this time is likely to look very different. There are new challenges. 
in, in particular in cyberspace, and there are hybrid conflicts. But we can also expect that the strategic co concept will include different measures of strategy and different kinds of means, perhaps also civil society. Um, for, for Against this background, I'm very excited to hear our three speakers today, the first of whom is Vesela Cerneva. She is the Deputy Director of the European Council on Foreign Relations and Head of the its SOFIA office. Her topics of focus include EU foreign policy, the Western Balkans and the Bal ba Black Sea region. Um, she has been the spokesperson for the Bulgarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She has been a member of political cabinet by, in the Foreign Minister Mladenov's cabinet. And she has also served as a political officer at the Bulgarian embassy in Washington, DC. So she is um, very capable and, and knows the, the Three Seas initiative with its extensions very well. Vesela, I would like to give the floor to you. Yes, thank you very much, Rina, and I hope you can hear me well. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you and uh, to talk about the Three Seas from the very bottom of the map, uh, because you described the map so well. Um, it is indeed about the Baltic, the Adriatic and the Black Sea. And uh, the Three Seas Initiative, which started in 2016, has its annual meetings and the rotating chairmanship. Uh, and last, the last chairmanship was uh, held by Bulgaria and here in Sofia. Uh, we had the last uh, three C summit uh, in June. So, or was it in July? Yes. Uh, so this is prob probably also a good point uh, to start. Instead of uh, going uh, much in the past, uh, I will try to explain the uh, three C's initiative uh, as uh, as one which is future oriented. And so how do we describe our future? I think this is the main question that uh, we should we should try to answer. Um, there are a couple of things that we should bear in mind when we answer this question. Uh, first and foremost uh, is that our world is very interconnected and this may sound very trivial, um, but when we think about it, um, Everything that used to benefit us, all of our links to the world, the fact that we could travel, the fact that we could trade uh, with whoever we like, uh, the fact that through internet we can access any corner of the world, any information that we need, uh, that through global media we could know about every event, um, all of that seems to be working backwards now, to be working the other way around. What do I mean? Um, there is an ongoing competition on who is going to, you know, to rule the internet, who is going to have the more important internet cables, um, who will be influencing other people's media in order to meddle in their domestic politics and transform their political landscape, who um, will be imposing sanctions on whom and how we cope with, um, for instance, secondary sanctions, um, who can stop the gas flow uh, and use the fact that we're interconnected in terms of gas infrastructure as a weapon uh, against us and uh, and make uh, and make that dependency of ours basically <laughs> work against us we have witnessed even um, the very blunt usage of migration as a weapon recently and you uh, where Wojciech sits, it's even closer, but you're not very far away either. Uh, 
when you when we saw that uh, that Belarusian President Lukashenko is really shipping people uh, from uh, uh, the Middle East uh, to the border with Poland and basically create a, a humanitarian disaster. This was again uh, weaponizing uh, the freedom of movement and the fact that we have all this, you know, prolif the proliferation of cheap airlines and you can charter, you know, an Irish plane and use it in uh, 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 in Syria and and get uh, people to the Belarus Belarus Poland border. Um, of course, there are also uh, the examples that were mentioned before, uh, uh, like the Chinese example, how China is weaponizing infrastructure. Uh, is something that has been well researched, uh, and the most popular example is the so-called OBOR, One Belt, One Road Initiative, um, which created a network of trade routes or uh, roads and rails uh, that help Chinese goods penetrate um, foreign markets. Maybe one other uh, infrastructure uh, initiative that is probably a bit less popular uh, is the so-called 17 plus 1 initiative, and this um, is one that uh, includes a lot of the uh, Central and Eastern European countries, but also the Western Balkan countries, and most recently also Greece. Um, and so how this uh, network of you know, global connections um, that seems to, you know, to be to be working against European interests. How can we, um, how can we act against that? Um, there are several answers to that, but the Three Seas Initiative, I think, is one uh, good example of a transit. Uh, it's a it's a transatlantic initiative that, however. I think is uh, coming to defend uh, uh, European interests uh, very much. The Three Seas Initiative, uh, interestingly, uh, is seen here um, much more as an economic project, a project that is supposed to create a facility for investment, for investment in infrastructure, in energy connectedness, and much less or, or let's say even the defense part of it, which you started by, is not mentioned at all. If you look at the documents of the Sofia summit, you will probably not see the defense bit mentioned. And this is, I think, primarily because the Three Seas Initiative is exactly, um, I think, trying to define defense and security in this much more much softer terms uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, protecting uh, connectivity, protecting uh, the, the way we trade, the way we travel, uh, our energy needs uh, from uh, um, foreign influence. Um, it was mentioned uh, that uh, different countries contribute uh, to this investment fund. Uh, the current investment goal is around 1 billion. I think it's uh, it's exceeding that amount already, um, uh, mostly because of the US involvement. Uh, it is There is a bipartisan consensus in the US on the Three Seas Initiative, which is probably also important for our listeners to, to know, um, as uh, President Trump, uh, also, but, but also President Biden's administrations have both been very supportive of this initiative. Um, of course, uh, for uh, Washington, the biggest asset of three Cs, I think, lies uh, at least in the short term with uh, the energy security issue and the energy independence. Um, uh, 
but also the, the infrastructure connectivity in broader terms. And um, the three Cs has already produced some results uh, in that respect. This year alone, uh, we have seen LNG terminals in, uh, built both in Poland and in Croatia. Um, and, uh, and these are, um, this is obviously uh, important given um, also the current energy crunch um, uh, that, that we're experiencing. If you allow me, uh, two more words on members. You mentioned Germany. Uh, the German president, President Steinmeier, who was in Sofia for the summit um, last summer, he mentioned that he would what he would very much want uh, the three seas initiative to become part of the european policies and i think this was an important signal uh getting a more active european involvement in three seas is going to uh be very helpful uh also for the kind of general framework uh but also for the motivation of companies um by the way, there were uh, four com 400 companies who were registered for the business uh, uh, summit in Sofia, so it was uh, very much an economic um, endeavor. Um, and the second country I would mention is Greece, because when you look north-south and when you try to fill that gap, right, uh, Greece is obviously on the on the bottom end uh, of that, and Greece was an observer. Uh, at the last summit, so maybe we will see that expansion as well uh, there in order to create uh, a complete uh, kind of uh, north-south uh, revival of infrastructure, which throughout the last decades has been developing logically, so from east to west and, and back. Um, and so this uh, axis is the meaning of the three Cs. Last but not least, and I know Wojciech is going to talk about this uh, much better than me, um, but uh, uh, President Biden and others have been emphasizing quite a lot on the issue of corruption as part, and fighting corruption as part of the agenda of the Three Cs initiative. Um, it has to do, obviously, with the framework that you create for businesses to invest, right? But it also has to do with good governance and uh, and good governance is in the interest of uh, not only companies and governments, but also citizens in that region. And I will stop here. Thank you, Vesela. I hope you can hear me OK. I seem to have a kind of a connectivity issue, but I think you can hear me. Um, our next speaker is uh, Wojciech Przybylski, who is the editor-in-chief of the Visegrad Insight and the president of the Respublika Foundations in F Warsaw. His expertise include foreign policy and political culture analysis, and uh, he's a frequent guest, among others, in Euronews. He is a Europe's Future Fellow um, at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, and he has co-authored, for example, the book Understanding Central Europe, which was published by Routledge in London in 2017. Uh, thank you, Wojciech, for being here today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Rina, and uh, thank you to the Finnish Institute of International Affairs for organizing and putting it all together. Indeed, there are so many uh, great topics that uh, our topic uh, was was so nicely positioned just ahead of the next, the upcoming presidency, uh, Latvian presidency, and I'm also honored to to be speaking just just before Edgar Sponders, uh, who is joining us from Riga. This is a real pleasure and honor. Um, I I will uh, talk uh, specifically about uh, the three C's scenarios for the three C's, and I'll introduce it from the perspective that is uh, our um, uh, our perspective at Visegrad Inside and my own perspective of analysis that we perform. Visegrad Inside is a 
uh, sec uh, democratic security focused think tank and media platform. We do network analysis. We specialize in foresight. We produce foresight uh, uh, ongoing uh, in an ongoing basis with uh, expertise linking the region. As you know, Central Eastern Europe, perhaps in Europe, has the biggest number of borders. So you have the most uh, uh, the, the the region of Europe that has the most of different languages and borders that is the main challenge one of the main challenges not only for political development and integration but also for economic integration as the goods need to travel people need to travel in order uh, to for the economies also to grow and to be stable now I'll uh, use a bit of a presentation also I, not too long but for for a bit of slides for those who want to watch it on the screen. I believe it will be also later available for those who registered. Uh, and this presentation uh, is based on a report that we have released. There one, of the, uh, one of the examples of a foresight uh, that we have uh, presented. Please, next slide. Um, that is... Uh, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, and the next one, this is the report that you see, uh, oops, uh, you just saw on the screen, uh, that has been released in July as, a, um, as an effect of a work, um, previous slide please, just for a moment, as an effect of, of uh, um, several, I mean, a couple of dozens and two dozens of meetings, workshops online, mostly during the pandemic, that interactive ones that integrate our design thinking methods in and strategic planning on uh, risk analysis uh, that produce eventually foresight. Uh, the three C's initiative futures exercise involves some 40 uh, experts and practitioners from all the countries of the three C's, but it wasn't easy because in some of the countries of the three C's, international affairs uh, experts do not know much about the initiative. So if you heard about it for the first time very recently, don't be, uh, 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 you, you, you don't stand out from the crowd also from the three C's region. And we discover, what we discovered is that the three C's initiative that is much talked about in certain bubbles, it's not really yet a fully integrated, potentially takes the shape led um, for several years already, uh, but there is also a sort of, um, deficit of, of discussion and understanding about it. And here is where we wanted to jump in, mapping out potential future scenarios. We started work at the end of the Trump uh, presidency administration, and we recognize that US importance and transatlantic link is a critical element in the development of the three Cs. It's not the only one, but it's very important. And we started to ask ourselves, what will be the future for the initiative once the administration changes? And that was our main motive for producing this analysis to bring forward first uh, the scenarios. But on the way, we understood we need to explore much more and uh, discuss much more the data, the real um, information behind the three Cs uh, that gives the perspective about the, the whole region and the initiative. So uh, one word, really one sentence, uh, what also three Cs is. It is overcoming, it's about overcoming certain legacy dependencies. If you look at the map of Europe, even from before EU integration, you naturally see that the number of connections that were mentioned earlier, uh, energy, transportation, and later digital or telecom connectivity, if that is represented on a map, a geographical map, the density of that map is definitely else dense in, in the western part of Europe and not so much in the central eastern part of Europe, let alone a uh, fact that most of the connections do not flow uh, north-south in our region. They only flow, they, they were only designed or mostly they were designed southeast, uh, 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 west and east. Now, um, the practical uh, element, the practical um, uh, dimension of that is that if you are planning a trip uh, by train from Warsaw to Sofia, you can get there in 30 hours with a distance of about 1,500 kilometers to cover. But if you want to go to Paris 
three, two times uh, the distance, you cover the distance, the same distance, in just half the time. Even more so, even more telling is the fact that if you want to plan this trip from Warsaw to Tallinn, Estonia, well, you can't really travel by train because there is no train line. Next slide, please. I, um, I will discuss now uh, certain scenarios uh, that we discussed in this context, in the context of the ambition to develop the region and its connectivity, but looking also from the security, uh, democratic security point of view. There is a lot of data at the end of this presentation, which there is no time also to present and discuss, which indicate both the elements which are uh, showing that that there is a big deficit of investment in infrastructure, which is matched, matched by um, enormous amounts of cohesion policy money from the EU. And yet there is a need for integrated strategies before, between the countries of three Cs. We need a leverage in a way, and three Cs is sort of a leverage to build strategies and synergies when planning cross national networks of uh, roads, energy, and telecoms, as they were planned before even the EU um, in the other parts of Europe. So this is a work in progress to complete the European project and, of course, to re reassure uh, the security from the point of view and the perspective that Vesela already mentioned, um, who controls the means of connectivity, controls, uh, controls the world. Central Europe has an ambition to regain control over its future um, and this is where the three c's uh, initiative comes from the ambition to be not only catching up with the eu and the european ambitions but to be uh, part of the EUP european direction um, in the shape of of the next decade to come it's also very important that we are discussing these four scenarios and the futures in a context of uh, ongoing debates on the democracy uh, uh, summit for democracy and yesterday's uh, release strategy how to fight corruption by the Biden's administration, which come very timely uh, also for our discussion, because any investment, any major investment in Central Eastern Europe um, that United States now are looking into it and the EU, uh, bears also risks related to malpractices, and those malpractices are oftentimes uh, exploited by actors from which are, which are called the revisionist power today. But on to the scenarios. There are four scenarios uh, that we deliberated and designed. The next slide, please. The first scenario that we have uh, to present is regionally segregated generations. As the things stand today, we observe that in some countries there are expert community and diplomats and politicians who have no idea that their country is involved in the three Cs. Should the situation uh, continue, we may end up in having some of the countries, most of the countries uh, um, invested in the investment fund, three Cs investment fund, but some countries may simply miss the opportunity or not really be engaged in shaping the direction, the shaping the ambition of the three Cs, leaving it to the others who may drive it in different separate ways. It can also become very volatile if, depending on who's in government, the positions of different countries may change. I will not elaborate that further, but of course there are good examples unless we have these points taken into discussion. Next slide, please. Scenario number two, we call it the Texas of Europe, explains the risks connected, um, a little bit elaborated on the first scenario, if you want, of uh, hijacking the agenda of three Cs by a radical right uh, uh, movements who would like to see it as a project that is countering European integration rather than reinforcing it. Such movements and political ideologies around that has already started to emerge and you can observe that across the region. Uh, you have also had them reinforced during the Trump's administration. Despite best efforts from people from the US administration, there were strong narratives of nativism or nationalism even being uh, hyped during the, um, that time. 
and they still continue to play an important role around the three C's initiative, often misplacing it and misrepresenting it as some sort of a historical narrative projects to regain the past uh, greatness of the region. Supposedly that was, I don't know when, but supposedly it was in the past. Next slide, please. The scenario number three that we also discovered through this deliberation uh, with our expert community and influence, civil society influencers is that, um, and that was ahead of July, so ahead of the German uh, president and others uh, advocating for it, uh, integrating three Cs into the EU project uh, more symbolically than realistically, because in real terms it is integrated in the EU ambition with the EU ambition, by um, adopting it also as one of the EU macro-regional strategies. Macro-regional strategies like Alpine region, Adriatic region, Danube region, are elements of the European Union collaborative efforts of different uh, sectoral collaboration, where countries that belong to that region try to increase their synergies in planning how to uh, planning their development policies and how to make best use of the EU funds available for that development. Now, the three CIS initiative has all these elements already in place, plus more. It generates its own funding and it has its own political agenda with heads of state leading that, unlike the other formats, and my, may serve as an inspiration of how, in the future of Europe, um, the regions will play a role in shaping part of the political agenda and part of the development agenda uh, that is so strategic to the future of the, of the bloc. And the last slide to show now, please, uh, almost the last one, is the scenario number four that highlights uh, the fact that um, there is a short window of opportunity for Central Eastern Europe to uh, use the existing quite favorable circumstances. Over 54% of the EU cohesion funds are already allocated for all the three CIS initiative countries. This is something like 200 billion euro. Out of, I mean, in comparison, you have a three CIS in, uh, initiative investment fund currently at 1 billion with ambition to grow to 2 million and maybe more. But this is an important leverage, as I mentioned, an element of integrating the policies of Central Eastern Europeans around their com common integrated strategy during fortunate times for, from the point of view of investing and um, in the times when there is no hot conflict uh, in global terms, which possibly may turn away some of the resources, not attention, but some of the resources of the greatest allies uh, of uh, of that region and the time is short therefore central europe for the past years has been catching up impressively overall with with some uh, differences depending on the countries um, and uh, has a, a promising path uh, in the future but it needs to act now also to learn how to be more self-sufficient in designing policies, investment policies, and generating their own money to uh, mitigate development risks and mitigate some of the long-term investment uh, gaps that exist across, across the region. And now the last slide, I will not um, uh, talk about all the points. These are uh, recommendations in the report, um, but one slide that I wanted to emphasize is relating to, uh, to the fact that ov overall across the region, there are risks related to democratic security. It's about corruption, it's about uh, polarization and misinformation, disinformation in the media and digital space. And there is a very low level of public participation in governance. All three mean a lot for investment climate. The Three Cs Initiative has an ambition to attract investors from around the world, to attract global investors beyond US and to uh, uh, make uh, the best of this uh, ongoing um, prosperity drive that we observe across Central Eastern Europe. But for that to, full, to be fulfilled next to very successful investment projects, you need circumstances, you need conditions 
of uh, having a good investment with low risks, low risks of corruption, low risks of civic protests uh, that derail some of the big long-term investments and uh, risks related to disinformation of lack of information really often uh, among the elites uh, that need to be there in order for this project to succeed. So luckily there are some initiatives that um, come forward. Our initiative, one of uh, those, is the civil society forum that we hope to organize next year and we have seen some really great response from the Latvian side. Here I'll stop uh, just highlighting that there are more, there's more data and there is more information for everyone participating in the next slides and I'm happy to share the presentation later with you. Thank you Wojciech. Um, now our third uh, and final speaker is Edgar Bondars. He is the ambassador for the Three Seas Initiatives of the Republic of <laughs> Latvia who is the host country for the initiative next year in 2022. Um, ambassador Bondars has served as Latvia's ambassadors to diverse countries engaged with the Three Seas Initiatives region, uh, also, for example, to Poland in Central Europe. Um, thank you so much for being with us here today, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rina, and uh, I would like to thank you for organizing this event. My words of appreciation uh, goes also to Finnish uh, International Institute of uh, Foreign Affairs um, and uh, to my colleagues uh, Vesela and uh, Wojciech. Um, uh, at the beginning, I would like to point out, Wojciech, thank you very much again for four scenarios. Uh, I believe that uh, there is no perfect scenario and uh, the, the possible scenario will contain something of every, everything. So, uh, yeah, but uh, dear colleagues, coming back to history of Three Seas Initiative, we see that uh, there has been a certain evolution. Uh, the idea started, as it was mentioned, in 2015. Uh, then first summit was held in Dubrovnik, Croatia in 2016. Uh, then um, transatlantic ties were strengthened in Warsaw summit. And then uh, in Bucharest and Ljubljana, uh, the uh, Three Seas Initiative Fund was creative, created and uh, become operational. Um, after that, uh, in Tallinn, uh, digital agenda was uh, brought on the uh, surface, and uh, and it was everything was uh, continued in in Sofia, of course. Uh, Riga summit uh, will uh, bring something new, of course, and uh, uh, what we will offer will be uh, the forum, uh, civil society forum. Uh, which um, was uh, the idea came uh, after um, um, after uh, uh, summit in Sofia, and when President announced uh, our President announced that next summit will be in Riga, also that uh, we will pay attention to civil society and forum will be organized. So we are working on that. Also, I would like to inform you that uh, the, we have a very strong interest to organize a parliamentary dimension in, uh, in the summit. But this is kind of parliament parliamentarian side. So everything goes to that uh, we are looking forward how to involve society more in the Free Seas Initiative. We all know that um, Three Seas Initiative is uh, politically inspired, uh, but commercially driven. And of course, uh, there's uh, a lot of thoughts how to attract invest, uh, more investors and uh, how uh, attention on, of uh, investment uh, investors will be very important. Uh, but uh, also the role of civil, civil society is very important. That's why we will uh, organized civil society forum and of course uh, the issues which were already mentioned like uh, um, the counter uh, fighting the uh, hybrid warfare and and uh, involvement of civil society of citizens in decision making process so this will be elaborated during the forum uh, so uh, it will help kind of uh, um, develop uh, let's say our regional identity, if we can speak about the identity of Three Seas Initiative region itself. Because, uh, well, I would like to point out uh, also that uh, 
Yes, uh, this is the eastern part of US, of uh, European Union, and um, and uh, we uh, were going through very hard times in history uh, under the communist uh, and Soviet regime. But we have to look at the region as uh, developing, very fast developing, with the best internet connections and possibilities uh, in, 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 in countries, with a lot of uh, inspiring, inspiring projects and, uh, and uh, big projects like Rail Baltica, for example. We are looking forward how to connect um, north and south. And, uh, and um, I think this, this is part of our new identity of, of this region. Um, well, um, we have to look at Three Seas Initiative as an uh, instrument that could ensure region's steady recovery, uh, create uh, the right preconditions for sustainable growth and uh, improve living standards. Um, it gives uh, also a window of opportunity of, uh, to think wider and further and identify our priorities smartly in order to live in a more dynamic and, and uh, effective way. And um, if uh, we are mentioning, for example, uh, security issues, of course, uh, the infrastructures are about security. We are, uh, we are not going very far away from that, but at the end, it's everything which should should be for for good of people. We all, everyone want want to use fast internet. Go uh, overnight from Warsaw to um, to uh, Sofia, or uh, spend just few hours in train uh, with a, in train from Warsaw to Tallinn with a nice stop in Vilnius or in or, or in Riga for coffee, for example. Um, so, but um, of course. Um, uh, Three Seas Initiative, I think, have a good future, and and the, our summit in Riga will give a wider uh, look to to the the issue of uh, of uh, of Three Seas Initiative itself. So um, yes, it will be very crucial how we will attract uh, attention of uh, investors, and also it's uh, great that there are huge interest of um, possible and in future investors, not only from countries like Japan and. Uh, Australia, but also uh, Nordic countries, and and it's very good that that uh, Rina, you organized this event to uh, get more acquainted uh, with the Finnish society with the idea of Three Seas Initiative. Um, there's uh, a lot of things we need to do in uh, in preparation uh, work for summit, but we are going ahead, and uh, soon we will come uh, with more information about. Uh, our achievements, our targets, goals, and uh, how we will do this. I will stop here, dear colleagues, and uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ambassador Bondars. I am uh, going to now um, accept questions in the chat from the audience. And first, I would like to raise two of the essential questions uh, brought up by Director Mika Altola to the panel. Mika asked you about the scope of the Three Seas Initiative's vision, and in particular, if it is supposed to be, in your particular point of view, should it function supplementary or complementary to other visions? And here I think we have already brought up a few different um, um, functioning visions. One would be the way that the European Union uh, functions in the world, um, the European Union is also drafting its own global vision um, and perhaps it can also integrate the Three Seas Initiative to that or I'm asking you if you think it is supplementary or complementary. Um, other world powers such as China, Vesela also mentioned, have initiatives such as the um, New Silk Road Initiative and other um, infrastructures. So I suppose a question would be about if the three Cs is supplementary or complementary, what should it function in reference to or together with? And Mika also asked you the scope of the initiative, sort of who belongs to it and what's the scope perspective? It's a very, very wide question, but you can answer with your own um, idea and perspective particular in mind.
who who should answer? It's for all the speakers and for the panel in general. So I, I can very quickly say uh, there, there, uh, the 12 countries that belong to the initiative is not exclusive, but it's clearly there is a clear cut why those uh, members are involved. They are mm, relatively new in the European project and geographically connected between these three regions. But uh, the connectivity doesn't stop at the borders. And I think this is the most important also from the point of uh, Finland, but also Greece or Ukraine. The three C's serves to increase connectivity across Europe. And uh, that, that's why other countries are looking and eyeing opportunities that are also adjacent to the three C's uh, initiative countries. On the question of EU uh, or China or supplementary com complementary, uh, the region wants to uh, stand on its own in a way of, uh, you know, ideas drive the attractiveness of the region and to become an important element of the EU attractiveness. There is the EU is so much interconnected in the report. We underline how much part of all the trade is with the EU, then also how big a uh, trade partner for the region uh, is the US and really a minuscule portion of that is China. If China thinks about the region, it's primarily as a transit uh, to the other parts of, of Europe. So from the um, EU perspective, the three C's builds up the potential of, and it's uh, uh, complementary to the goals of the EU cohesion and growth. From the Europe in the world perspective, it is supplementary uh, in the strategy to reinforce uh, European resilience against the influence of uh, revisionist powers because it offers simply better terms of investment in objectively uh, much needed and, and existing uh, gaps uh, in, in the infrastructure and digital uh, and energy, of course. Thank you. Ambassador Bondars, would you like to address the question or? Yes, well, uh, thank you. I completely agree with uh, Wojciech and uh, it's uh, uh, the three C's initiative idea is complementary, of course, to European Union. Well, our strategic partner is uh, is uh, Commission of Europe at the end. Uh, and uh, about regarding supp supp supplementary, uh, I can um, I can tell that, uh, of course, in uh, in a way, it's also supplementary if we are looking for more wider than only European Union territory and space of European Union. So it's absolutely obvious. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Vesela, do you have a perspective to the question? I think it was, uh, it was clarified. Maybe just to add that a couple of years ago, uh, this complementarity with the European Commission strategy was not that clear-cut. Um, and especially while Trump was uh, trying to, you know, uh, to divide Europe and was basically bullying the European institutions, the Three Seas Initiative with a very pro-Trump Polish government uh, was seen as kind of an alternative plan uh, to, um, to to the European cohesion instruments, um, and uh, you know I'm I'm personally uh, convinced that the fact that now the Biden administration is so actively supporting this initiative also helps paradoxically for its Europeanization. Uh, because it's much easier for the European Commission to um, to 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 help and to uh, also help think through how those infrastructure plans uh, can be coordinated and can become complementary. Thank you. I also very much agree with with that. Um, then I have a question from the audience um, that thanks you for your clarifying answers. 
And then we have a question about the position of Ukraine. Should Ukraine be integrated into the Three Seas Initiative or in some other way be in a special consideration? Again, I'll jump in quickly just to, to say that Ukraine is already eyeing uh, opportunities with the Three Seas Initiative during summer meeting so at so-called Crimea platform. This was one of the opportunities, occasions when Central European leaders were, many of them, Three Seas Initiative uh, partners. Uh, they were confirming the ambitions of Ukraine to benefit from the Three Seas Initiative. But Three Seas is for EU members or is designed by EU members. And uh, those countries put already, this is the first step into what they have to learn. They put uh, their investment money, development money themselves. Ukraine is no position, no position right now to do so. It is going to be like the Western Balkans, a beneficiary of uh, the of the successful uh, projects when carried out in the by the three C's and with the three C's help and leverage on the EU money that exists. I mean that are not right now expected for the region. Thank you, Wojtek. Vesela, would you like to address this? You already in your remarks brought up the very, to me, very interesting idea of Greece and Greece's also geographic position and a, in, a, in a way Greece also is a central position in the Mediterranean re receiving refugees and migrants and I see it as a question like this, but would you like to address the question from the And audience? also, we should not forget that uh, the port of Piraeus is Chinese-owned. Uh, so if there is a one belt, one road uh, kind of access point uh, from the Mediterranean into Europe, it's probably through the port of Piraeus. So, um, I think it is quite logical to have uh, Greece integrated in that effort. Um, but the question is also, I think, the, how interested uh, Greece would be to invest in the three Cs. Um, and again, it's not only about maps, but uh, in this case, when we look at the map, it explains quite a lot. In, uh, as Wojciech said, in terms of interconnectedness, um, all of the or most of the existing infrastructure is going in uh, in that other uh, east-west direction, and uh, and I think it should be also in the interest of Greece to have uh, the north-south route um, work much better than than it does now. Thank you. Ambassador Bondars. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think it's not only Ukraine uh, who is uh, kind of observing closely what's happening in Three Seas Initiative and uh, would like to benefit like uh, countries, other uh, Eastern Partnership uh, countries like Moldova and Georgia is uh, looking forward also. And I think sooner or later, this or the other way, uh, they will be benefiting from uh, successful projects within the Three Seas Initiative region. So uh, we have to look further as a, as a uh, kind of uh, those who are uh, friends and partners in, in uh, near future, I would say. So I completely agree with the Wojciech again that this is, uh, so far, this is European Union uh, project within European Union. Um, but, uh, you know, it's in, in, in big context, we, we have to look further. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I don't see further questions from the audience at this point, and I think that we've come uh, very conveniently and very punctually to the end of our time limit on the discussion. It very rarely happens, but I, <laughs> I'm i happy to see that uh, our timing coincides the actual timing in the invite as well. Um, I, would, I, I would like to thank our three speakers because I also learned more today from what I have known from before. So 
that was good. And also from bringing forth such um, diverse points of view from because the three C's initiative really engages so many different sectors, governmental, non-governmental um, and um, society as well. So all of your three perspectives were quite diverse, but complementary. I don't know about supplementary, but definitely complementary. <laughs> And um, on behalf of UPV, I would like to thank you for your contributions as well. Um, I think we had a very um, interesting and also detailed discussion introducing the topic to the Finnish audience. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all, Rina and Fia and Mika especially. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thanks.